my name is Laura Townsend. I'm the program associate here at the American Society of International Law. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our Tiller House headquarters and to tonight's event. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Society, the Society is a nonprofit and nonpartisan membership association for those who are interested in the study and practice of international law. We engage in a diverse set of activities encompassing both publications and programs, such as tonight's panel. Many of these activities are made possible by the involvement of our members. For example, tonight's panel was organized by the Lieber Society, which is one of our interest groups. Uh, ASIL has over 30 interest groups organized around different international legal topics, and those groups organize different workshops, events, resources throughout the year. I'll let our moderator talk a little bit more about the society, but if you have any questions about membership in ASIL or about our upcoming events and conferences, I'll be around and happy to speak to you about those after the event. So with that, I'll hand it over to our panel and let's get started. So uh, I, I want to reiterate the welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, as, as Laura mentioned, we, um, the Lieber Society is a sponsor of this event. The Lieber Society is an interest group of ASIL that focuses on issues relating to the law of war, um, and anyone who joins ASIL can also join the Lieber Society as well. Um, so I am delighted to um, introduce our panelists this evening. Um, it should be a, a really terrific event. Um, we're lucky to have them here today. Um, I'm going to introduce all the panelists, and then we're going to hear a presentation that's focused on the Bales case. Um, Ms. Hodgkinson is going to offer some commentary, and then we will have a brief discussion and open it up for you um, to, ask, to ask questions and to engage our panelists here. Um, so to my right is Lieutenant Colonel Jay Morse. Um, he currently serves as the Chief Trial Counsel Assistant, as the Chief of the Trial Counsel Assistance Program located in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Um, he, under his guidance, um, the Trial Counsel Assistance Program, TCAP, provides prosecu prosecutorial training and both direct and indirect assistance to every jurisdiction in the U.S. Army worldwide. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Moore supervises 23 special victim prosecutors, all criminal law experts focusing on the prosecution of crimes involving sexual assault, domestic violence, and children as victims. And most importantly for today, Lieutenant Colonel Morse was a lead prosecutor in the Army Court Martial of the case of involving Mr. Robert Bales. Um, I'm going to be brief on the introductions just so we can get right into the discussion. Um, to my to the far left, we have Marari Zafar, who is an Afghanistan subject matter expert at the Defense Intelligence Agency Center. She previously worked um, as an international development consultant on USAID-funded economic development programs in Afghanistan, and she served on an, as an expert witness on Afghan cultural norms at the court martial of Sergeant Robert Bales. And to my immediate left is uh, Ms. Sandra Hutchinson, who is the Vice President and Chief of Staff of DRS Technologies, a mid-sized defense company, and she previously served in a number of very important high-level positions in the Department of Defense, including as Chief of Staff to Deputy Secretary of Defense, of Defense Rock William J. Lynn, Deputy <coughs> Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detaining Affairs, and Deputy to the Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. So I'm very pleased to um, welcome the panelists here today, and I hope you can join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Uh, first, if I could start um, by just recognizing a few people in the room, your special guest. And then to clarify, Ms. Stafford was and certainly helped us throughout the case, but we actually had a few other people who were, uh, who were experts who were prepared to testify at trial. The two folks I do want to recognize, one is Mr. Ahmad Shafi. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about victim witness liaisons that we use um, uh, throughout this process and how important uh, Shafi was to our success and, and uh, certainly not less important, um, but uh, John Riesenberg just got out of the Army. He was a prosecutor on this case as well. For all of you who have been part of litigation teams or a team in, uh, in general, you got that one person who's kind of the motor of, uh, of your team, that uh, was John. And certainly, from a legal aspect, um, uh, we wouldn't have had near the success we had without, uh, without John. I'm happy to give him a, uh, some public uh, um, support, uh, which he hates right now. <laughs> um, so I do want to thank uh, Mayor Jensen and Jen Daskal for organ organizing this. Um, we put uh, a lot of work into this. Um, it is a factually complex case, but I understand that uh, both for limits of uh, time and also I think um, the investigation uh, and the cross-cultural part of it is probably a little bit more exciting. 
So I'll try and breeze through some of the facts um, and get right to the investigation. So first, what you see in front of you, of course, is uh, um, Afghanistan. It's bordered to the west by Iran and to the east and the south by um, uh, Pakistan. Um, particular for us is the Kandahar province, and even more particular for us is the district of Panjway. About 20 miles west of the city of Kandahar uh, is the Panjway district, specifically the Horn of Panjway, which is the far western portion. Um, and really for us, we're focused on, on uh, three of the villages there, the village of Ali Kozai, Najibiyan, and um, Belenma. Uh, the villages themselves are composed largely of, of uh, compounds, just like the, sea, the two you see in front of you. Um, they're mud and brick, they don't have electricity or plumbing, uh, they have dirt floors. Um, there are no paved roads in this village. They are uh, 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 almost exclusively Pashtun. Uh, for as far as I know, um, there aren't any who aren't Pashtun and who aren't uh, Muslim. Um, they're very poor. Uh, they are largely subsistence farmers on, on uh, uh, probably grape and um, specific for us, uh, again, are actually three different um, villages. You see to the uh, north is the village of Ali Kozai. It's about 650 meters north of the village of Belenbai. You see that in the center left of your screen. VSP stands for Village Stability Platform. It's really just an abandoned compound that American and other coalition forces used uh, as a base to launch their missions. Uh, about 800 meters south of VSP Belenbai, or the village of Belenbai, is the village of Najibian. In the upper right-hand corner, you see Fab Zangabad. Fab is forward operating base. In March 2012, it had about uh, an infantry battalion of U.S. soldiers. Also important for us, it had a medical treatment facility that could handle uh, emergency situations. It also had a camera. Um, this camera is called a PGIS, a Persistent Ground Surveillance System. It's a camera that can see at night or during the day. It's really just slung on the underside of an aerostat balloon, so a miniature version of the blimps you might see at, uh, at a football game. Um, I want to talk first about VSP Balambai, that's the American base there in the middle. The inset here is uh, um, the gray area you see, it's just an abandoned compound, there are about 10 foot walls, um, very thick walls of mud and earth. Uh, this area right here is the living area of the soldiers. This area here is the living area of the Afghan National Army, there were about 40 soldiers who were here at the time. Uh, this area here is called an operations center. If you can see the small square right here in the lower right hand corner, uh, that's a tower. Uh, at night, that was the sole tower that was occupied as an observation post. There was an Afghan National Army soldier on it, uh, um, two hour intervals throughout the night. Uh, you see here this break in the wall, that's the sole entry and exit point to VSP Balambai. Uh, you can drive a vehicle through it. The gate is really just a two by four with a strand of concertina wire or barbed wire around it. Um, and as you, uh, is obvious to us now, you could walk on and off the space fairly easily. I want to focus on a couple pictures that are actually from this guard tower you see in the lower right hand corner. Uh, this is the Afghan living area you see in the foreground. Off to the uh, west or in the background of the picture um, are some of the, uh, the villages. This picture was taken about three weeks after the offense when John and I were actually there. Um, I took this picture while I was standing in the Afghan guard tower. This one's important because uh, if you can see a group of soldiers standing right here, they're standing on the road. There's a road that runs east-west right in front of the, the uh, base. It's called No Name Road. Those soldiers are standing in front of that sole entry exit point. The blue building, one half of it's an abandoned madrasa, and one half of it is an abandoned clinic. Uh, if you see this line of trees off the left-hand side of the screen, that runs along a uh, canal, which goes due south uh, into one of the villages, or one of the compounds that part of the hills. Visit that. Area. This is actually pictures taken from the operations center. We're looking to the uh, northwest from here. Um, this is a shower. This is a shower facility. The rest of those cans uh, are shipping containers. Those are also the living areas of the Special Forces soldiers who were on the base at the time and the three American sergeants, so traditional infantrymen. Uh, one of those canisters was the home of Staff Sergeant Robert Bales. So as I discussed, uh, from VSP Balambai, the units conducted their mission. Their mission was really just an offer an alternative to the villages in the area. Although Panjway was a uh, um, kinetic area, meaning that it was dangerous, uh, Panjway is, is the uh, historical home of the Taliban. It was friendlier to the north in Ali Kozai than it was to the south in Najibian. But to be honest, if the soldiers were going to take fire at all, if they left the base, it was likely to come from a village called Garandai, which is even, even further south and east and actually off of the map. For our purpose tonight, we're really just focused on four different uh, compounds. These two in the northern corner of Ali Kozai belong to a gentleman named Haji Saijan and Haji Mohammed Naim. Uh, Saijan on the left and Haji Mohammed Naim on the right. Uh, and they own each one of the compounds. Um, again, because of, uh, of uh, our time restrictions, I'm not going to throw the wire diagram up there of their families. 
Um, it looks like something that the DOD would put out. Uh, but important for our story is that this is Saeed John's compound. This is Haji Naim's compound. On the eastern part of Haji Naim's compound actually live uh, members of Saeed John's family. Um, in total, in one of these rooms by uh, about 1 o'clock in the morning on the 12th of March, a room probably half of this size, there were upwards of 30 people uh, in pitch black who were hiding from Sergeant Bales as he was entering, entering his rounds into their, uh, their home. Um, in the village of Najibian, first is in the northeast corner. You see that single compound that belonged to, to a, a gentleman named Mohammed Daoud. The picture you see here is his brother. Mohammed Daoud is dead. Uh, that's Mullah Baran. Um, the children you see there are a mix of his own children and the children uh, um, belonging to his, uh, his brother. And then lastly, in the uh, southwestern corner of Najibian, we see the home of Haji Mohammed Wazir. That's Haji Wazir. He was in Spin Boldak uh, the night that this happened. Um, you are looking at his sole surviving child, a young boy named Habib Shah. On the 11th of March at about, uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, Sergeant Bales killed six of Haji Wazir's seven children. He also killed Haji Wazir's mother, his wife, his brother, and his nephew. Um, all told, over the next four hours, sometime between midnight and about 4 o'clock in the morning on the 11th of March, Sergeant Bales executed, uh, murdered 16 people, and attempted to murder another six. 17 of the 22 was a woman or a child. The first person he injured, or murdered, excuse me, um, was an older gentleman who was actually asleep when Sergeant Bales shot him. The second person was a gentleman who was uh, a father to four girls. Um, Sergeant Bales shot him at close range. The third person he shot was one of those young girls. Um, the gentleman's name was Nazir Mohammed, and he shot uh, about his two or three year old daughter, a girl named Bola, also at point blank range. The last person, Haji, or excuse me, the last person Sergeant Bales would murder that night um, was in the southern village of Najibien. It was Haji Wazir's mother, a woman named Shatrina. Sergeant Bale shot her twice. She wasn't dead, so he literally stove her head in with his boots before he walked uh, north back home to VSP Balamo. This is literally the route that Sergeant Bales took at about midnight as he uh, left the base. First place he went was into Haji Saeed John's home. Um, he left these two homes only when he realized that he'd become low on ammunition. And only then did he walk back to VSP Balamo. When he walked back to VSP Balamo, he took the exact same route. Uh, he first stopped in and talked to, uh, first he reloaded, then he went to the room of one of his fellow sergeants who was asleep at the time. Uh, he woke the sergeant up because he was in the room looking for, uh, for ammunition and for other weapons. Um, the other sergeant told Sergeant Bales that he needed to get back to sleep. Sergeant Bales first told him where he had been. He said, hey, I just got back from Ali Kozai. I was killing military age males. Sergeant Bales, in fact, knew that he was killing women and children. Uh, he then, uh, uh, the sergeant, the other sergeant said, hey, I, need, I have guard duty go back to bed. Sergeant Bales then said, good, um, I'm going back out, I'm going to Najibian, and I'll be back at five. Uh, take care of my kids. Um, again, Sergeant Bales left the base, walked to that southern town of Najibian. Uh, when Sergeant Bales walked back on the base the first time, he, he left undetected. When he came back on the base, there was an Afghan guard on duty, um, a, a soldier named uh, Nematul. Uh, he said to him, Sengai, in Pashto, it means um, stop. Uh, Sergeant Bales, excuse me, he said to stop, he said stop in Dari. Sergeant Bales didn't speak the language. Um, he knew Sangai, which means how are you doing in Pashtu. Uh, he kept walking back to his room. Sergeant Bales left the second time. There was now a new Afghan guard on duty. Um, this uh, soldier named Tash Ali, this soldier said the same thing, he told him to stop. Sergeant Bales again said Sangai in, uh, in Pashto and continued on his way to the south. At this point, the second guard realized that something was going on. He had spoken to the first guard. The two of them got together, talked to their direct supervisor. Um, they found a translator. The four of them went to that American Operations Center. Um, they eventually got the message to the uh, captain in charge of the base at the time, a special forces officer named Captain Dan Fields. Captain Fields did two things. Uh, he did an accountability check. Um, everyone was accounted for, uh, except for Sergeant Bales. That includes all Afghan National Army soldiers as well. He then called over to that Fab Zangabat, that American base in the upper northeast corner that we talked about at the beginning. Um, one, he told him that uh, he had a soldier missing. <coughs> I'm sorry. He got a patrol ready to go look for Sergeant Bales. He wasn't sure what was, uh, uh, if Sergeant Bales had walked off, if he had been kidnapped, if he was sleepwalking. That was his, uh, his initial reaction. Um, so he called over to Fab Zangabat and asked them to turn the cameras to the south uh, and to help find Sergeant Bales. About an hour later, that camera operator calls back and says, I think we found your guy. 
What you're looking at right now is literally from the moment that camera operator found Sergeant Bales. Uh, we see him lying down in a field. He's about a third of the way back from that village of Najibien. Um, Sergeant Bales is lying down in the field because the soldiers at BSP Bell and Bay are launching illumination rounds and parachute flares in an attempt to both find Sergeant Bales and also to help guide him home. Because again, they're not sure why he's off the base. Sergeant Bales lies down. Um, he is uh, um, wearing a Kevlar or a helmet. He has night vision goggles that are attached to that helmet. He's carrying an M4 rifle, which fires a 5.56 millimeter round. He's carrying a 9 millimeter H and K pistol, and he's carrying a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Uh, he's also wearing a cape. Um, the cape is actually a blanket that Sergeant Bales took from one of the doorways of Haji Wazir's home. So after he lit those family members on fire, which I failed to tell you, uh, 10 of the 11 folks in Haji Wazir's home, Sergeant Bales actually lit on fire. Uh, he grabbed a blanket from the doorway because he wanted to be warm on his walk home. This video is important for two reasons. One is it's obviously irrefutable evidence that Sergeant Bales is off the base. The camera stays with him uh, until he comes back on the BSP Bell and The other was important for us, uh, for us to be able to show that this was not a soldier who was affected by alcohol or steroids or rage or someone who seemed to be in anything other than uh, full possession of his faculties. What you're seeing right now is Sergeant Bales looking through his night vision goggles. Uh, he looks left and right for signs of disturbed earth or anything else that might indicate that there's an explosive device planted there. He actually walks over the wall instead of going through those choke points, which are more dangerous. The camera stays on Sergeant Bales uh, again for about the next 15 minutes. He walks north on this road, it's called Charlottetown Road, until he gets to that east-west turning road. Uh, he makes a right. Um, you see Sergeant Bales pick up or run. Uh, by this point, Captain Fields has told that patrol he was going to send off the base to, to sort of stand down. Um, but he does send out three soldiers to meet him. One is his warrant officer, his number two. The other two are those two sergeants, um, one of whom was one of the soldiers that Sergeant Bales talked to uh, um, when he said, hey, I've just come back from Alicos Island, I'm going back out. Um, again, the camera stays with Sergeant Bales for the duration. Uh, as Sergeant Bales, you see him pick up a run as he gets to the gate. You see one of the sergeants pointing a weapon at him. Uh, that soldier tells Sergeant Bales to put his weapons down. Sergeant Bale's very first words are, are you fucking kidding me? His second words is he looks at that other soldier, the soldier he had visited uh, in between visits off the base. Um, the second thing he says is, Mac, did you rat me out? That soldier's name is Mac. Uh, over the next about eight hours, Sergeant Bale makes multiple statements, none of them outright confessions, but all of them admissions that showed us uh, that, um, that Sergeant Bale, again, was, was fully aware of, of what he was doing uh, throughout the night. So we can talk about this, I can talk about this, uh, um, for, for days or weeks. Um, what I want to focus on, of course, is, is three separate things. One is the investigation of our case. Um, two is how we interacted with the victims and witnesses over about the, uh, the 18 months. Um, and lastly is what we did to prepare for trial. Um, so the first part is, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the investigation. Um, John and I were actually here in, based in here in uh, Fort Belvoir when, uh, when we found out about this offense. Um, we had investigators and uh, actually, one prosecutor who ended up being a prosecutor on the team on the ground in Kandahar at the time. Uh, um, as I'm, I'm sure all of you know, when you are prosecuting or, or litig litigating a case in general, you want to get involved as early as possible and you want to know as much about the facts, um, most of which will never see the light of day in the courtroom. Um, we were hamstrung because we were here in the States. Uh, additionally, we couldn't make it out to the crime scene until the 2nd of April, so a full three weeks after the crime occurred. Um, Afghan CID or Afghan detectives made it out the next day, uh, so they were able to gather some evidence. Um, we didn't get out there again until three weeks uh, after that. We had, we had about uh, um, five detectives and probably 60 support personnel to include aerial support, um, so helicopter gunships, uh, that allowed these guys to get to four separate compounds in two separate villages in one day. So you can imagine uh, how quickly these guys were processing the crime scene. Um, and here's where we'll focus a little bit more on the investigation aspect. So this is the exact same room. Uh, these pictures are taken about three weeks apart. The one on the left by, uh, by uh, uh, the Afghan detectives. Uh, that's the room of Mohammed Daoud's home. He was the first village that Sergeant Bales visited, uh, excuse me, the first compound that Sergeant Bales visited in uh, uh, that second village, Najibien. Sergeant Bales executed uh, Mohammed Daoud in front of his, uh, his wife and his, um, his children. Um, they then drug him back into the room and sat with him uh, until the next day. They were so afraid of what was going on. Um, they just sat in the room with their, their father dead. Uh, um, another uh, a, a bit of a 
non sequitur just to show you the difficulties of, of investigating. Um, that Afghan uh, CID detective right there, who did a pretty good job for, for the circumstances he had, he actually died in a car crash. Um, so whatever evidence, uh, whatever problems we had, chain of custody, you can imagine um, the difficulties uh, just became worse. It also brought home to us the fact that, that um, the longer this case was drawn out, the more difficult time we might have producing people at trial. Um, so same exact, uh, same exact room. Um, the evidence that you see there, the, the, uh, the blood-soaked carpets, um, blankets, we had none of those. That's literally what that room looked like uh, when our, our guys were finally able to get out there. Um, this is a room in Haji uh, uh, Wazir's home. So this is the exact room where Sergeant Bales uh, burned those 10 bodies. Again, this is the exact same room taken about three weeks apart. I want you to focus on a couple things. One is um, this picture off to the left-hand side. Again, this was taken the morning of the crime. So CID was able to, Afghan detectives were able to get out there uh, under very adverse circumstances. They actually came under fire when they visited the southern village and one Afghan soldier was killed. Um, and I think one or two were injured. Uh, by the time these guys got there, you can see that the, the home has already been empty. You can see it's missing a stove right here. I mean, they literally packed up the stove um, we realized later they moved everything from all of the compound or all the rooms into one separate room, brick and mortared it over, uh, and came back later and removed all of their belongings. Um, this family has not returned to this, uh, uh, this compound um, since the offense. The other thing I want you to focus on is the lower left-hand corner, the lower left-hand wall of both pictures. You can see uh, a little bit better, obviously, on the right picture, but you can see on the left side as well um, some lighter marks. This is where the family members physically scraped matter, hair, and blood matter, in some case, or blood, in some case, brain matter off the wall to ensure that it was all buried with the deceased, um, whom they buried that day. So literally the clothes they were shot and burned in and the blankets they were wrapped in uh, to include their, their, um, as much of their families as possible that they could ensure that they were um, respected properly and buried properly creates evidentiary issues for us um, at trial. Uh, again, for investigative purposes, um, there's a video of, of uh, um, the Afghan detectives sifting through this, this pile of evidence, literally sifting through it. So as far as um, uh, uh, you can imagine a Western crime scene, even if there's, there's uh, um, people who aren't involved in law enforcement or prosecution, even if no one like that is present, we see enough on, on Western TV that you don't touch a crime scene. So this, this idea of, of having a sterile uh, crime scene um, where no one's messed with anything, and you have a pretty good idea of, of trying to reconstruct the crime. We just didn't have it. Um, video of these guys going through it. Um, I am sure that uh, um, some of the Afghan soldiers, because this is what they do, they can resell the brass, literally picked up the extended rounds and put it in their pockets um, so they could sell it later um, or put it in a different room. I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, the last sort of, uh, of uh, uh, important uh, or interesting aspect of the, the investigation, particularly this room, uh, the first people to, to, to walk into this room were actually elder women in the village. Uh, they did not want to go into the compound because there weren't any males there who belonged to this particular home. They didn't want to, to dishonor or exceed their, their uh, cultural boundaries. Um, they backed up. They waited until the first male showed up, a gentleman named Kamaluddin, uh, who ended up testifying at trial, a, a, a really fantastic guy. Um, he drives up from Kandahar City. He shows up. The first room he goes into, he sees women who are burned and their clothes are missing. He doesn't want to do anything to dishonor them, so he then backs out. He then asks the women to go back in to cover up, uh, um, to cover up the women to ensure that they were proper so that he wasn't disrespecting them. Only then does he grab other males, go in, pull all the bodies out, separate the men from the women, uh, 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 and then ultimately put them on trucks and drive them to VSP Valentine. There was a protest outside the gate that morning. The last picture I want to show you, this is, a, um, this is both taken the morning of the crime uh, by the uh, same Afghan investigators. This is a picture from uh, <coughs> Haji Mohammed Naim's home. I show you this one because um, there are two different placards, 11 and 12. None of us have any idea what they, they indicate. I don't know why 11 is different than 12. Um, the entire CID or the entire Afghan detective file was a page and a half. Um, so, no idea what 11 and 12 stands for. You see on the left-hand side that there's a, a pile of, of brass, expended brass. No idea where those came from. Um, we were ultimately given about, I think about 19 different um, ex expended rounds, so brass, either 9 mil or 556. No clue which rooms they came from, um, which compounds they came from. Uh, my experience 
um, with uh, both uh, Iraq and a little bit with Afghanistan as well, as well is that um, evidence plays better when you can see it, and there's a lot of it. It doesn't matter where it was. Uh, when I was in Afghan or in uh, Iraq, we used to have um, the uh, Iraqi police would take everything they could find in the proximity and pile it up in one spot because that looked really impressive. That's good evidence for their system. For us, that's just not really helpful. Uh, we were able to get a lot of uh, evidence from um, both from Sergeant Bale's clothing. Um, uh, we were able to pull multiple DNA profiles. Um, I want to say nine, uh, um, nine different profiles. Uh, we were able to get that largely because of the cooperation from the Afghan <coughs> witnesses. We, we took buckle cheek swaps from a lot of them, um, family members, I'm sorry, uh, and hair clippings as well. Uh, also, this was important for us. Um, John wrote uh, a, a ironclad, I'm sure uh, every court in the world is going to uphold his 37-page stipulation of fact. Um, that was just an absolute monster. I mean, just this, this beautiful document that, that locked in um, an agreement of facts between us and the defense, signed by Sergeant Bales and the prosecution team. Um, I bring this up because this is uh, um, the barrel of Sergeant Bales' 9mm. What you're seeing right there is the slide. So when you fire a 9mm, uh, the slide rocks backwards, it causes the expended shell to eject, and then it pushes up a new shell. When it slides forward, it loads that other shell in the chamber. That's what allows you to go bang, 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 bang. When the slide rocks back like that, and you see that, that blood and viscera inside the barrel, that allows us to argue that Sergeant Bales was actually doing contact shots, where he's putting the barrel to human flesh. So literally touching his gun to people's heads. Uh, we were able to put that in the stipulation of fact, and I, I think that's pretty um, aggravating evidence. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is our interaction with the victims and the witnesses. Uh, as I said, there were, there were six people who were injured in the, the, the northern village. Um, five of them ultimately went to Kandahar Airfield. Um, first to Fab Zangabad, where they had that medical treatment facility and then to um, Kandahar Airfield where we were able to treat them at a hospital called Roll 3. Um, we were also able to get investigators there to talk to them. We personally didn't talk to them for, for several other than to say, I'm sorry this happened to you and we're going to do our best to ensure that you, you have justice. Um, our detectives were able to talk to them. Um, this is important uh, to, include, um, to include these three folks. In the upper left hand corner is a young boy named Siddiquila, uh, in the middle is a young boy named Rafiula, and in the upper right is that gentleman, Haji, or excuse me, Haji Muhammad Naeem. Siddiqui was shot through the ear. All of these guys were crowded in that room where I said there were upwards of 30 people in a room half this size, and Sergeant Bales was just entering rounds. Siddiqui was shot through the ear, the round skirted his head, and then went out the back and fractured his skull. Rafiullah was shot through one thigh, and then the bullet was in, embedded in another thigh. Um, Haji Muhammad Naeem was actually shot at point blank range. He was shot in the face and in the neck. We asked him at, uh, um, at trial, or perhaps at, our, at the, uh, uh, the initial, the preliminary inquiry, how close this person was when he was shot, and he said, he had a water bottle exactly this close, he said, as close as I am to that water bottle. So he's standing outside his room trying to stop Sergeant Bale, Sergeant Bale says nothing, raises his rifle, shoots him twice, steps over, and then starts opening up on everyone else in the room. So our ability to talk to these guys early was important because all of them who were there in the northern village, who are living witnesses, were all adamant and consistent that there was one person involved. Uh, this contradicted with, with a lot of other statements from people who weren't there, uh, but from people who said they talked to people who were there. We heard upwards, of, uh, heard upwards of as many as 40 people, so a platoon of American soldiers with helicopter support, um, those flares, uh, all of that was important to us. One is because, one, I realized that, that um, there were some cultural divides we were going to have to bridge in order to um, ensure that, that these guys were able to testify at trial. The second was just a realization that we just remembered things differently. Um, our memories are different, uh, and, and I, I personally, um, Ms. Zaffer, I surely will, uh, will uh, um, highlight it a little bit better, but, but I, I think for us it was imagining what your own worldview would be like if you never had access to television or the internet um, or cameras or, or pictures or whatever it might be. It just it adjusts your ability to remember things. Um, so I'll stop there because Amore has some really interesting uh, commentary that, that we, we, we realized as the trial was going on, but it's, it's pretty fascinating. So the difference is that for you guys, I can set up a slide like this, and this is how we organized our thoughts. Is we think literally left to right. Uh, I'm a PowerPoint nerd, so I love doing this type of stuff. I love doing a trial, and I love doing it to help brief people so they can understand what happened. You guys can probably look at this and sort out, uh, have a pretty good idea of, of what we think happened, to include the fact that there were helicopters in the air twice uh, over an hour-long period of time. For them, 
They don't think linearly. Um, everything is focused around a central event. So all those things that we look at linearly, for them it all supports what they recall, which is that some guy walked into my room and started shooting everybody. So those helicopters that were in the air, uh, the fact that uh, there was an IED a full week or an explosion a full week before, in their minds, whether it happened before or after, in days or hours after that initial event, it all supported that event. Um, so this was another illustration that, that uh, illustrated to us that we were going to have to, um, we were really going to have to step outside of, of how we normally approach a case uh, to ensure that not only they could talk to us and we could talk to them, but we could convey our team and theory to the trial, to the jury eventually and help them testify. Um, part of that is we initially had plans to, uh, we were going to have 3D models, we were going to have movies, we were going to have a, a terrain model kit about as big as this table that we could use to not only have them walk us through what happened, um, but for us, again, to explain the trial if we needed to. Uh, that went out the window the first time we interviewed Haji Sai John. Um, John and I actually are, are interviewed him, or interviewed him. Um, he's this really gregarious older guy. He wasn't there. Um, his wife was killed. His brother was killed. His cousin was killed. Uh, and two of his grandchildren were, were injured. Um, the first time we sat down and talked to him is, is we showed him this picture. This is a picture of his door. Um, it's one door in a compound of, of four other doors. It's a distinctive, uh, unique door, even within his compound. Presumably it's a door he went in and out of many times during the day, uh, many times over years. Um, he lived in this compound for a long time. Our goal was really, um, this was our starting point to try to figure out what life is like inside this compound. Again, with that long-term goal of being able to articulate our theme and theory of the case uh, and really show that these, are, these guys were human beings if we eventually got to a contested trial. Um, so this was our starting point. Hey, Sai John, you know, show, tell us what goes on in your room. Like, what, is this your room? Um, we got to the point where he finally said, uh, he literally picked up the picture, looked at it like this, looked behind it, looked on the ground, and then said, uh, I don't know what this is, but if, if this were my house, this would be Haji Muhammad Naeem's house. He was talking about how too close, or how close those two compounds are together. And if you look at an aerial shot of his home, and his neighbor's house, you can see exactly what he was talking about. Um, I will also tell you that uh, um, uh, a young boy named Kudratula, um, he's probably 15 or 16, and probably really was a hero in this case. When Sergeant Bales finished firing, he jumped a wall, <coughs> grabbed a motorcycle, went and got his brother, and they were able to borrow a car and come back and, and save probably three lives, um, if not more. Um, we interviewed Kudratula the same day. I took a picture of him with my tablet, uh, and I showed it to him. He looked at it, he smiled, and then what did he do? He swiped his finger across the screen. So he knew exactly what, what uh, it was, but I do think that's, that's commentary for, for uh, um, nothing other than uh, uh, the situation isn't hopeless, and we realized it wasn't hopeless for us either. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, trial preparation. So um, you want, uh, let me back up, I'm sorry. So I found out that, that I was going to be the lead prosecutor of this case on um, the 15th of March, so just a few days afterwards. Um, I will tell you that uh, um, my boss has called me and said, if you could pick anyone in the Army to prosecute this case, who would it be? And I gave him a list of three people, um, one of which was uh, John Riesenberg. Um, my boss has called me back on the 15th and said, okay, you got John and Rob Stell, and that other guy's off and you're on it. Uh, so about, uh, maybe about 24 hours later, um, I wrote down, aside from being a PowerPoint nerd, I'm a journal nerd, I wrote down these three things. So this is literally my journal. You go back to the 17th of March. These are the three things I said we needed to accomplish in order to be successful. I wanted a conviction. Um, we wanted to have our victim satisfied, or at least understanding of our process, and we wanted no insurmountable mistakes. John was responsible for number three. Uh, so, so part of this is, is once I had that, one and three um, involved this thing called backwards planning. We call it backwards planning in the Army. You do the exact same thing, I am sure. Um, you know you have to be somewhere at a certain time, and you start working backwards to figure out what time you have to leave. For us, that backwards planning um, involved developing early a theme and a theory. So what we thought our theory of the facts were um, and the theme. The theme was uh, my count is 20. We didn't come on this until the end. arrived at this until the end. Sergeant Bale said this at one point. Uh, also in the stipulation of fact, my kind of count is 20 is that Sergeant Bales was basically counting bodies as he was shooting them. It's a statement that he made to other soldiers later, uh, later in the day. Um, Part of that theme in theory uh, that changed very slightly as we went up, um, as we went through uh, um, investigating the case, preparing for trial. Um, but two of the things that we wanted to make sure we got was that that we were able to um, find common ground again, both between us and the witnesses, 
um, the witnesses and us, and also anything that we'd able to, to argue uh, eventually at trial. Um, one of those common grounds was women and children. Uh, this is probably everyone can agree, we don't like to shoot women and children. That, that transcends uh, um, cultures. Uh, we anticipated that one of the things Sergeant Bales might argue in an attempt to get sympathy, whether a trial at the merits or a trial in sentencing, was that, uh, think of his kids. Sergeant Bales has two, two young children. So um, at trial, at the sentencing argument, we were able to say, please do think of Sergeant Bales' two children. But when you're done with that, think of the 48 children who were affected by Sergeant Bales' actions. We played this at the sentencing hearing without commentary. Um, uh, before, uh, before I hit play, I set it up with the fact that Sergeant Bales affected 48 kids uh, over those four hours. So 48 children were either murdered or injured by Sergeant Bales, uh, lost a parent, lost a grandparent, or witnessed Sergeant Bales shooting someone. the other day and someone asked a question about the unknown. Um, the first person charged with Sergeant Bales entered that night, but again was a, a, an older gentleman named uh, Kudida. Uh, he was a cousin, I don't know if that's an American style cousin or an Afghan style cousin, but he was a cousin and a family member to Haji Muhammad Naim. Um, he had seven kids. His wife was of the uh, um, Kuchi tribe. They are nomadic. She lived somewhere else with those children. We ultimately weren't able to find out those, uh, um, those kids' names. Um, the other common ground we realized is that uh, we wanted to make sure the panel understood um, our theme of the case. So at one point during the trial, um, let me back up. When Sergeant Bales came in uh, after that first trip off the base and before he went back up to second base, he told, again, Sergeant McLaughlin, um, uh, after he told him where he'd been, he said, I'm going back out to Najibian. Uh, I am uh, um, to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, I, if I don't come back, then, um, or he said, I'll be back at five, I'm sorry. So I'm going to Najibian, I'll be back at five, and if I don't come back, take care of my kids. Well, we thought that uh, that, that statement, take care of my kids, might indicate that Sergeant Bales is going on a suicide mission, right? That's what you say if you don't think you're coming back. Take care of my loved ones. Well, the manner that he delivered that information, the order that he delivered it, we were able to argue that Sergeant Bales wasn't going on a suicide mission. He was actually going on, on a mission because the pattern that Sergeant Bales and the order that Sergeant Bales relayed that information fits squarely with the language of a soldier. So when you find that common ground, we're also able to realize that, um, particularly an infantry soldier, half of our panel were infantry. So an infantry soldier uses this thing called a gatwa. Uh, it stands, it's, they can use it at any given time. Um, it's second nature to them. They can say it off the top of their head. It stands for where I'm going, others I'm taking with me, um, time I'll get back, and what to do if I don't return, and actions to take if I'm hit. So again, the order that Sergeant Bales presented that information fits exactly with, not a suicide mission, but, but a got one. I'm going to Najib Bien, he's going out alone, I'll be back at five. If I don't come back, take care of my kids. So we're not able to talk to our panels, um, our juries, uh, and they are, they are very stoic, but I think we thought that this was a pretty good piece of information to us to be able to say that um, Sergeant Bales is nothing other than just a really bad guy. Uh, and here's a good example of it. He's still being a soldier, um, even when he leaves that base the second time. The last thing I want to talk about is that number two. Um, I, I realized in hindsight that victim satisfied was uh, not only ambitious, but a, a little bit um, unfair. And, and it had nothing to do, again, this is, the, the more I think about this, um, because I think that's another part that none of us will really anticipate is how close we became to some of these guys um, and how much we, we came to care for them, frankly. Um, I, but, but part of it was, was to make sure that, that um, yeah, finish my, my, my initial thought, um, to make sure they were satisfied and make sure they were understood the process. I don't think I would expect any of you to be satisfied with the result. Um, I'm sure that there are probably some people in the room who think that death penalty was the only appropriate option in this case. I'm sure there are a lot of people in America who had uh, 10 of their 11 family members burned. Um, there would be no other reasonable or, or satisfaction other than uh, death, and maybe not even that. So I think that was unreasonable. Um, on my part. What I do think was reasonable was making sure that we understood the process. Part of that was hiring guys like, um, like Shafi uh, and three others. Um, we also recognized this, this uh, early, um, early on. We actually had uh, Ms. Afra come in and give us a brief 
on culture. Um, we were able to find a woman named Jamila Atmar, um, who is, there's a trial team, um, Jamila Atmar, who was uh, in Afghanistan at the time. She's a U.S. citizen. She's from Kandahar. She's been a U.S. citizen for about 20 years. We knew we wanted someone who could um, walk equally uh, comfortably in both Western culture and in, in Afghan culture, particularly in Pashtun, Pashtun Afghan culture. Um, someone who could have uh, um, great sympathy for, um, uh, for the children uh, and also for the males. Be respectful to them, but also put her foot down when she needed to, which she had to do many times. Um, she, she really was phenomenal. As, as, uh, um, as much as I give credit uh, to John for our legal success, I give credit to Jamila for, for uh, um, success, and, and Shafi and, and uh, Rasul uh, and Jalaluddin as well, for our success in making sure that they stayed with us for the duration. Um, we asked a lot of them, uh, and they did it every single time. Um, they kept us on our uh, edge of our seats a few times, but, but they were with us until the very end. That's probably a good segue for them. Great. Thank you. Would you like this, or let me change slides for you? Um, <laughs> but um, before I start, I just want to add a disclaimer that these are, are not the views of the Defense Intelligence Agency or the Center on the Regional Arts and Culture. Right. With that said, I'm clear enough. Um, I'll take a few minutes to talk about the, the cultural context in which this case happened. Um, obviously, you think Afghanistan yeah, is different on many counts from this, but what I want to focus on first is. Um, looking at accountability and justice, to look at accountability, you really have to get an understanding of what Afghan identity means as opposed to American or Western identity. Uh, and certainly in, in the West, we, we tend to uh, think about individual identity as, as much more important, uh, you know, a more important consideration in relation to other factors. Um, going to school here, one of the things that I learned in, right away off the bat was that you, when you think critically for yourself, you make choices that are that relate to what you want. And so your individual agency and your ideology is largely or your value system is developed by you. Uh, now in Afghanistan that's in part true, but that those values and those ideologies <coughs> develop as a result of the environment that you're socialized in. So they reflect your family, they reflect your ethnicity, maybe your tribe, your tribal, but certainly it's much more local level and certainly the family has a lot of influence in terms of the person that you are. So when you think about individual accountability, the actions that people do are reflected of their families. So blame as a result, uh, or responsibility for an action, it's not just an individual uh, attribution, it's something that's been attributed to the family or the larger collective. So things like um, you know, the Bell's case obviously is not, you know, it, it's one of those things where um, and Colonel Morse was talking about how initially the Afghans thought this was a platoon of American soldiers that had perpetrated this. It's, it's related to a few factors. One is the fact that you know, there was this gen genuine uh, disconnect in the perception that this could have been perpetrated by a single person. Uh, it may also have been a factor that this is a highly masculine, uh, patriarchal society. Uh, so the idea that one American soldier could show up into an Afghan man's home and cause so much destruction seemed unpalatable to, to the more masculine senses. Uh, the other aspect of it, I think, was uh, also that for them, you know, uh, somebody does something or thinks some, something because of, like I said, the environment they're socialized in, or they, they borrow ideas from their families and their communities and such. So to them, Bales couldn't have acted alone. He couldn't have acted without the support, either ideological uh, or tangible support of the American uh, armed forces. There's certainly that disconnect there. Uh, I also want to point a couple of other factors on that, uh, that spectrum of individual accountability. Uh, religion and, and the supernatural. So these elements are, you know, perhaps to us in the last night, I'll make a vast generalization, but we kind of see those as, as much more new. We create our own circumstances. Uh, but certainly in, in Afghan culture, you can manipulate your circumstances through um, you know, what psychologists term as magical thinking. You can affect it by placing or removing curses or entrusting your faith and you know, these shamans or these mystics who are also Muslim holy figures. Uh, and there's also religion, of course. We, we hear constantly, inshallah, inshallah gets thrown about wantonly, uh, but it means something. It means God willing. Uh, so for a lot of you know, Afghan Muslims, it's, it's God's will what ultimately happens. Um, that kind of brings me to the fact that all of, 
all of it you see about individual accountability and on why people relate to families as they do, uh, it ties into this perception of honor, uh, or perception and honor. Uh, those things form the basis of social relationships, uh, and they underpin a very important aspect in Afghanistan, which is respect. Uh, so when we think about, you know, we talk about responsibility, but another thing that relates to this concept is uh, the shared narrative of truth. Uh, so you know, I know that the team kind of struggled a little bit trying to figure out you know, which, which version is right, what are people saying, um, but you know, if, if there is, if something happens, and a village elder or an elder person in your family espouses a certain idea or a certain narrative of what is truth, uh, you don't necessarily want to go and contest it for fear of being disrespectful or insolent. Um, so again, this is you know, broad strokes here, but in general, this is kind of what this is for. Um, what this means is that those kinds of ideologies basically reinforce informal justice mechanisms in Afghanistan. There are three types of law uh, and jur jurisdiction. The last one, as you can see there, that's more of the informal uh, mechanism. Uh, Afghanistan has a, a statutory or a constitutional law. Um, whether it's enforced or not is a different <laughs> question, but it's, it, it has a constitutional law. Um, and that constitutional law includes elements of Sharia law. Now, Sharia law is Islamic jurisprudence, um, and it, it's become associated with the, um, the rule and enforcement of the Taliban. Uh, it's not necessarily that, so it's not what Taliban equals Sharia law, but I mean, they drew on a very strict, very literal interpretation of, the, of Sharia law to, you know, to do what they did in Afghanistan. But uh, in general, you know, Sharia is the overarching type of law. The other thing that it informs is, is customary laws. Uh, now, customary laws are socially based and they're socially enforced. It's really up to the community to do it. Um, in places like Panjwai, uh, that Customary laws are, uh, or not as they're called, uh, are informed by Pashtun Wali, which is a, a Pashtun cultural code. Uh, now I want to explain this a little bit because it's, uh, I, at least in the DOD, it's become this like this magic key for everything. Oh, you know, there was a spat in the community. That's Pashtun Wali. It's, oh, it doesn't work like that. And if you go to these, these predominantly Pashtun areas, some people won't even know that that term exists to define the things that they do. Uh, there is a tendency of things, especially in, uh, in policy circles that you know, I've been exposed to, where they need to categorize actions and things in Afghanistan. For them, those, those lines are very much blurred. Uh, so for them, it's a way of life. So Bashkamali is a cultural code. It's not an, uh, an Islamic code. And uh, this is an important distinction because uh, the Pashtuns that are in places like Panjwai were Pashtun far longer than they were Muslim. Uh, so they had developed these codes long before Islam got introduced to them. Uh, so they draw upon them to, to contextualize their way of life. Uh, now under Pashtun Wali, these types of laws are, are honor bound. So they concern things such as the honor of women. Uh, well, women become really kind of capital uh, for honor. So protect, you know, protecting them is a man's job. As a result of that, it becomes a very patriarchal society. And so these things you know, the, the patriarchy and the honor for women, they reinforce one another, but it's also uh, a cultural code that reinforces social ties and alliances with them. Maybe marriages are arranged, um, you know, revenge, things like that, or, or not even revenge, but, but the just, that form of justice is very much uh, collective rather than individualistic, as we would see maybe in other parts of the world. Um, moving on to that, so what we see in, uh, in French way is you know, customary law where justice is it's local, it's swift, and it's personal. So for the, the witnesses that came and traveled to Kandahar, from Kandahar to uh, Fort Lewis Accord in Washington State twice, uh, they found the system, you know, the, American military, or the American justice system, and then the military court-martial process specifically, um, irreconcilable. Right? They found particularly jarring because it was it took so much longer, but and, and there were all these other factors involved, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but suffice it to say that, as Colonel Morris was saying, the victim, victim witness liaisons like uh, Mr. Shafi here tonight uh, were essential in being able to broker both cultural and linguistic understanding between you know, two populations that were so disparate. Um, and Panjwai is, is an unbelievably rural way. This was for a long time their initial exposure to anything outside of their village and their community. Um, so you have that, and, and part of explaining the, you know, the, the cultural differences of bridging that fight was also to ensure the cooperation. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the victims and the witnesses. 
So there are challenges right off the bat uh, with the investigation process. Uh, one of them I think uh, Colonel Morse already alluded to was that if we talked about how questionable is, is an honor-bound cultural code and it really concerns the protection, the virtue of women. Well, uh, when there was, you know, there was a room where a lot of the female bodies were piled in and they were exposed and they were charred, and Colonel Morse mentioned that Kamala did, uh, one of the gentlemen had, had walked into the into the room. So he'd already, you know, by doing so, he he crossed the boundary. He also crossed the cultural boundary because here are women that are, you know, naked. Uh, he didn't want to confer disrespect and dishonor to them, even though they were dead. So he backed out, had to go find other women who then came and, and tampered with with the evidence in a way. But for them, they didn't see this tampering with evidence. Right? The, the priority there is not the evidence. The priority was the honor of these women. You had to protect them. Um, so that, that was one of the issues. But the other part, too, in terms of uh, respecting women in those communities was that they were trying to find the names of the female victims. Um, and it was unbelievably difficult to get the names. And, and in part because these men are not accustomed to sharing information about uh, their female relatives to men that are not kin, uh, especially to men from the West, especially to men from the Western Armed Forces. <laughs> so it was this, this completely, this huge divide that they had to cross. Uh, giving information about not just names but also uh, injuries uh, that were sustained by the women. Now, if you look at the slide, one of the things I want to point out uh, is that in America we have a courtroom, and, and a courtroom is pretty familiar to everybody. Uh, through the you question why, through these customary uh, laws, the main mechanism for arbitration is uh, a jerga. And it's a local council. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term Loya Jirga by now, which is the grand assembly that takes place in Afghanistan when big decisions need to be made. So it's part of the political process as well. But here, um, sorry, I'm going to put laser square into your forehead. <laughs> um, you can see right here, it's, you know, this is a traditional Jirga. Uh, a bunch of elder village uh, men. And this doesn't really have to be tribal. Uh, but you know, they'll sit around, and, and they will talk openly about a certain issue and try to work on this issue. Okay, so this is just a traditional form of jirga. Now, in the US, it's obviously very different. So for a lot of the Afghan witnesses, what they saw was the one, Bales was, they, they were really incensed because Bales was removed from that, right? Because it was just physically taken away from where the crime had occurred. He was brought 7,000 miles to a different courtroom. Uh, was, he, it, it took, the uh, military court martial about 18 months to prosecute him, which, from my understanding, uh, is, is an incredibly quick amount of time to get that sort of sentencing time invested. Uh, it cost a lot of money, and ultimately the sentence was life without parole, not death. Now, had Bales been Afghan, and had he been subject to a, a jirga as such, uh, it would have been convened probably within a matter of days. Uh, it would have been an open forum and it would have cost very little money, and more importantly, it would have been very localized. All the people that had been aggrieved would have been there, because it was a, a, in a local area, probably held in someone's house or an outside area like that. Um, and it wouldn't have, yeah, the cost would have been limited. Um, and the result would more than likely would have been death, which is what they were um, seeking, which would have been uh, in keeping with the customary laws. Um, now, the other aspect of this, too, is that for them, it was not just jarring that it took so long or that the, the sentence was different, but also because in America, the, uh, the burden of proof is, you know, here, somebody's innocent until they're proven guilty. Okay? And it's the job of prosecution teams and such to, to work towards that. <coughs> in a case of the case, largely lies with the victims and with the witnesses. Um, now, for them, they felt that there was so much evidence and so much that there was no need to argue there, there shouldn't have been a trial. And he gets no trial, he gets no jury, or you know, no trial, no jury, and certainly no mercy. It was, that sentence for them was, was seemingly lenient. Um, but moreover, they, from a spatial point of view, they also found that jarring because the American court system, you, know, you come in, there is a witness stand, there's a judge, it's a very structured. And I don't think it's very confining. So they felt like they were being confined, whereas were they in a jirga, they would have sat around, everybody would have been equal. The reason they sit in a circle is because it's, it's an egalitarian principle. So there is, nobody actually presides over it. This is, the tribal structure in Afghanistan is segmentary so that power and those relationships are diffused rather than hierarchical. But the American system was very much hierarchical. 
uh, and they couldn't speak until they were spoken to, and they, you know, they were, whether it was a line of questioning from the prosecution or through cross-examination, that's really the only time when they could voice what they wanted to say. Um, which they saw in contrast to Bales, uh, who, who some of them who had not seen him since that night and couldn't really remember seeing him, uh, walked in and they saw him sitting, you know, front and center, dressed in his you know, dress blues. And they asked, was he in the room? And then when people said, yeah, he was, he was sitting right there, they thought, oh, he's dressed like a general. Well, he should be in rags. He should be, you know, beaten, battered, and blue. Like, why is he sitting there as an equal with, with everybody else? So these things were very different in terms of their perception. But one of the biggest things was that that military, the courtroom, and the structure of the system limited their speech. And when Haji was here, one of the victims took the stand, you can see here, uh, he was being uh, questioned by Rob Snell, another one of the prosecutors. But he sat there and there was so much more that he wanted to say. But you can see the structure, Bales is sitting there. Again, this is just a courtroom drawing because there are no photos, but you get the idea in terms of where everybody sits. And then you've got you know, people sitting there as a objective observers just watching you do this. So completely different than what they had seen. But when he took the stand, he was really hesitant to get off. And when he did, the questioning stopped. And he said, I didn't get to say what was in my heart. Because he had, they had told him, and he had complied, uh, you know, that you can only talk when, when someone's asking you questions. So he kept asking, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? So he left without really getting, uh, a, you know, feeling like he got uh, everything off his chest in the way that he wanted to. Uh, and they believed largely that as a result, as a, you know, ju justice will serve the American way. Um, and you know, in many respects, yeah, would, would they have wanted death? Sure. But I think the fact that he got life without parole, they were sufficiently satisfied with. And, and part of that was, you know, when, when the sentence was being called, uh, one of the, the victim from witness liaisons uh, turned around and gave him the thumbs up that, yeah, you know, he did not get life with parole. Uh, and some of them broke down and they started crying. Um, so there was, you know, Mola Baran, one of the victims said that he was not you know, happy with it. Uh, I think he'd been one of the ones that had actually broken down, but he said he was now 5% you know, happy with it, which was a uh, an overall 4% improvement from... He was 1% happy before. 5% <laughs> yeah, success rate. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, and again, they, they took a lot of solace um, in, in the, their religious beliefs and the thought that inshallah one day, you know, if, if this justice wasn't served, then their form of justice would be served uh, in the afterlife. Uh, but I think for all of them, the prosecution for that, and to focus on a lot of differences between the commonality and the shared sentiment was certainly one of uh, relief and justice in whatever way was, was served. <coughs> Okay, uh, great. Well, let me, um, let me step back from this particular case. I mean, I'll use it a little bit as an example, but I'm going to try to put this in sort of a broader perspective of some of the bigger, um, you know, military justice versus international justice questions about how these war crimes cases are, you know, occur around the world and the decisions that are made. Um, and I specifically want to talk first about the forum, you know, the military justice system versus another. Um, second, I want to talk a little bit about the investigation and prosecution, some of the details we've heard today and the, how that, that is similar and or differ to other tribunals that have tried these types of cases. Third, I'll talk a little bit about sentencing, in particular the death penalty issue. And then lastly, this dealing with the local population and, and whether or not the trial is the way to best do that or not. Um, so starting from a forum perspective, just a couple basic principles to, to go back. I mean, I, my own perspectives have been developed on this. Again, I was the deputy of the war crimes ambassador, so I dealt with the war crimes tribunals all around the world. I've been to Cambodia, Sierra Leone, I've dealt with the ICTI and the INTER, and I helped build the Iraq High Tribunal in Iraq, and I spent a year on the ground there. And so I've spent a good amount of time working at the State Department and the Defense Department dealing with this international criminal justice uh, area. And I started my own career as a Navy JAG officer, so I'm also very familiar with the military justice system. Um, and so, you know, from the first standpoint, he is an American soldier and a military member. And so, you know, the reason the military justice system is the appropriate forum for a case like this, you know, when the local population looks at, you know, we want to try him here or we want to try him somewhere else, is that 
that is a guarantee we try to make to our service members when they join the military, is that when we put them over in harm's way in different places, that they can at least be assured that their constitutional right to a fair trial will be protected. Um, that doesn't always mean that they get a U.S. trial, but it does mean that in the vast majority of circumstances, the U.S. will take every effort to maximize jurisdiction. Um, we do that through status of forces agreements, many of you are familiar with, with other bilateral agreements, with temporary agreements. Um, uh, when we go into a temporary mission or a, or a, a exercise, and we do that, you know, in a variety of other ways. Um, it furthers the international principle, frankly, of host nation accountability for service members, too. This isn't just a specific United States military issue. I mean, the United Nations, when it trains troops, it trains them under the guise that host nation responsibility, the, the nation that is sending the troops, is the first and primary resource to use in a time of a crime that's committed overseas. And so they all have to work on having portable enough justice systems so that they can hold their own people to account when they go to other places, peacekeeping environments and other locations that may not have a full justice system up and running. And even if they do, that they are the first right of jurisdiction. Um, I, I want to go uh, you know, a couple steps further and say you know, that the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the U.S. military justice system, is based on the U.S. constitutional protections. And you know, has been, has been challenged up to the Supreme Court in a variety of contexts over time. And so, you know, it is one of the higher standards of justice you're going to see. Uh, compare that again with, you know, if Sergeant Bales instead went to the JIRGA process, you know, and sat through a very quick trial that happened quickly based on local expectations, got the death sentence, and was killed before a normal appeal would be carried out. Um, while it may have been more satisfying to the local population, certainly swifter and easier, it would have been very challenging for not just us dealing with that back in America as far as constitutional protections, but what message does that send to other service members we try to recruit into the military? You know, obviously Sergeant Bales, something went seriously wrong in his training as a soldier for him to commit the crimes that he committed. Um, but nonetheless, you know, when we recruit people in, the vast majority of our, our, you know, service members serve honorably, and so we want to recruit good people, and to do that, we have to give them guarantees of a fair justice system. Um, second, though, if you look at the international criminal tribunals or other alternatives, you know, the question was posed to me in coming to this panel, you know, what about a military commission or another international tribunal? You know, what, what are the alternatives out there? You know, clearly in a case like this, a military commission is not an acceptable alternative. You know, first off, they've historically only been used by the U.S. for enemies, not for our own people. Even though the acts they may carry out are as bad as the acts of an enemy. I mean, so you can't characterize, because at that precise moment, he was not acting in good conscience as a military member. The reality is he was still a service member who was only there on a deployment in Afghanistan. And so if you look back at the Kirin case, you know, post-World War II, where the German saboteurs were tried in the military commission and sentenced to death and executed quite quickly, um, that was nonetheless still, they were still enemies. Um, you look even to the military commissions we have today, and we have only been charging our enemy aliens in these trials. And so, you know, the military commission type atmosphere isn't one clear that we would use against a U.S. service member. Um, if you look more broadly at the International Criminal Tribunal, even if you look to the International Criminal Court Statute, which enshrines this very principle of complementarity, the idea that host nation jurisdiction comes first, and if and when a host nation doesn't take responsible justice themselves, then international justice kicks in. Um, and, you know, you can, the only cases that we've really seen of that principle recently being tested since the ICC went into effect was the case involving the British troops in Basra during the Iraq War, where you know the British did have an investigation, but it didn't ultimately lead to a court martial, and the ICC decided to take a look into it anyway because the UK was a state party to the ICC; it had gone into effect, and there was a question as to whether or not the state had taken you know its own responsible behavior. So, under any norm of ICC jurisdiction, whether we were party or not party to the Rome Statute. This is still a case 
that would have gone to the United States military justice system. So there isn't another real forum in this case other than the exact forum that was chosen. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the implications of that forum. Um, in the investigative process, you know, certainly there are advances that we have now in this type of trial that we didn't have in the Kirin case, that we didn't have in the Lieutenant Kali case, if you recall from Vietnam, where he systematically loaded bullet by bullet and killed women and children as well. Um, because here we actually had camera footage of this, that, that could show us the actual state of mind of Sergeant Bales, which is a pretty amazing thing to have in any war crimes context. I mean, in the most recent of cases, we've been able to use some video footage in the Sudan Tribunal. We've been able to use some forensic evidence, however limited, in some of the more recent cases in Sudan and in Iraq and elsewhere. But for the vast majority of war crimes cases that have been prosecuted, you know, this DNA swabbing of the live victims, you know, close enough in time to prove who they were um, rather than just a name or a, you know, a list that the local population comes and tells you to the judge, these are the people that died, but you can't match them up because they've already buried them. You know, this case actually had some better chances than some of the other war crimes tribunals that I've certainly been involved in and the prosecutions and investigations that they had to go through as investigators for these tribunals. Um, and the benefit of that is, again, as I talked about how the military justice system, the U.S. system, is one of the highest standards of evidentiary treatment you would have, is that, candidly, the evidence required to convict in a court-martial may even be harder than what you would need in a regular war crimes tribunal, because they don't follow the same U.S. standards in all cases, and historically, they haven't even had, necessarily, always the best ability to go in and get evidence. In Iraq, we were investigating, for the most part, 20 to 30-year-old crimes. Um, and in Cambodia, they've been investigating, you know, 40-year-old crimes. And so it can be very difficult to have that real-time video footage and DNA swabs and all the other good stuff that we now have. Um, and I will echo that the challenge here of not having had Afghans watch a lot of law and order is common to all the tribunals. I mean, almost everywhere where there seem to be major war crimes problems or war crimes committed in a context of conflict zones, the local population doesn't have an expectation as to what justice should look like. They don't have a context. They don't know to protect the evidence. So it's a fairly common problem that investigators and prosecutors have to deal with in these very complex tribunals, which is, which is one of the reasons, by the way, that international war crimes tribunals tend to be much longer in time than the 18 months that we faced here. I mean, Milosevic, remember, we were at year four when he passed away before he was actually convicted. Um, and even in the best of cases, which I would argue the, the Iraq High Tribunal was a fast case, it was still a year and a half, and it was the same timetable with an actual appeal, um, which was faster than any war crimes tribunal in history. But nonetheless, you know, in general, they tend to be slower and, and much more expensive, probably, than this court martial ultimately cost. Um, so to move on to just a couple more points, because I know you want to ask questions. Um, the death penalty, the sentence here. I mean, you know, what the interesting irony is, again, is that the military justice system, you know, which authorizes a death sentence against its own service members, and rarely, by the way, likes to actually use, um, is a much higher penalty than almost any international tribunal will ever, ever authorize. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Milosevic couldn't have gotten the death penalty, the Rwandan genocidaires couldn't get the death penalty, and yet dealing with those lo local populations and telling them that, by the way, you know, we're going to bring them to this fancy international court, and you know, the maximum they can get is life in prison, <coughs> but you can't get death. Whereas almost all of their local systems, by the way, authorize the death penalty. So if you were tried in Rwanda as a low-level, you know, uh, supporter or thug who was supporting some of the inner Hamway, uh, you could be eligible for the death penalty. Whereas if you were one of the top genocidaires and went to the International Tribunal, it wasn't one of the authorized penalties. And so this whole death penalty issue has become significant because the trend is very far away from it. It was the most significant issue we faced in the Saddam trial and in the Rakhai tribunal 
because the Iraqis would not have a tribunal on their soil that did not authorize death. Um, part of the reason for them was, you know, you could say it's based in culture. You could say that it's based on, you know, a whole bunch of other issues. But the bottom line is, they just feared that if Saddam was in prison, he'd get out, right? And so the Afghans here may wonder whether Sergeant Bales will get out, as Lieutenant Kali did after the Vietnam conflict. After all the people he killed, he was later pardoned. After the war, in the later, re, you know, the public sentiment over what had happened. So we're closing up. I just want to say one more thing, which is dealing with the local population. Um, in most of these war crimes areas, we have, we have begun to develop the notion that the trial itself cannot be your only truth-revealing process. If you expect to get all the testimony that will help the population heal, come out of a, a court, then your tri trial will be lasting too long and cost too much money to serve the very purpose it's supposed to serve. And so, to complement that, <coughs> most of the modern tribunals have come up with much broader outreach and truth-revealing processes that help document historically what happened, help you know, help a victim tell what is in their heart while it not being necessary for that to happen on the witness stand. Um, and so I just, you know, put that in broader perspective that a lot more needs to happen with this population than this trial. So, on time, it's time. Sorry, no, I, thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you, and this is an amazing um, panel, so thank you, everyone. I, I'm going to use the moderator privilege to just ask Lieutenant Colonel Marks, a few questions, and I'm going to open it up. Um, but I have a million questions, and so I'm just going to ask a couple of them. Um, one, I, I'm just when you started talking about Sergeant Mack, I was very curious to know whether there are any consequences to him, or there should have been consequences to him for not having done anything. It seems like he could have stopped. Sure, I, I, I will say that both soldiers, uh, the two uh, sergeants who met Sergeant Bales at the gate, both of them have been drinking with Sergeant Bales for clearing the night, which you're of course not supposed to do in Afghanistan. They both were faced administrative reduction um, for that offense. Um, they both subsequently uh, just ETS from the Army, so they just ended their term in service. They did not re-enlist. Um, as far as him not not uh, not reporting, um, no no uh, no legal consequences per se. But I think our impression is that he, there are probably some long-term consequences for him uh, internal uh, as to why he didn't say anything, why he didn't take that that claim seriously enough. And then my second side of the question just uh, relates to the evidence on the ground and whether I mean, the, the description of the Afghan CID was pretty drastic. I'm wondering if there was anything that they collected that they could use and related to really why did it take so long? Why did it take three weeks to get up there? It, it was tough working. I mean, they, they really did a very good job. But I think the same, as are our, our, um, some of our interactions with the witnesses, that the more questions we would ask them, I felt that I think we started to feel that they thought Either we were idiots or we were accusing them of lying, like kind of trying to catch them in a trap. Because to them it was the guy walked into the house and killed everybody. What more do you need to know? Um, that extended a little bit to the Afghan CID as well. Again, um, these villages were, were about uh, 600 meters. One was about 600 meters to the north and one was about 800 meters to the south. Walking along the road, that's a fairly easy walk. The sketch that we got back from the lead agent, a different gentleman than the one you saw in the picture, showed these compounds in complete wrong areas and up to 4,000 meters. So when we're talking to him that, that, no, no, in fact, one person could have done this, a common uh, um, response from them was that it's too far, one person could do this walk. So, so it was, I do think they did a good job under the circumstances and given the tools that they have, mm -hmm. um, because we did get some, some physical evidence from them um, that we were able to use. Um, we had absolutely, we would have had an extraordinarily difficult time with chain of custody had this been a, a contested court martial. Uh, the reason it was so difficult is because we were concerned for security situation, um, for the security. Uh, um, we didn't know if there were IEDs planted out there. We had, we had heard all sorts of reports um, that uh, um, the Taliban had done something to the the compounds. Turned out not to be true. As a consequence of the Bell's actions? Or? Uh, I think as a consequence of Bell's actions and also to prevent us from coming in. Again, the Afghans, there, there were some Americans who accompanied uh, the Afghan investigators the second day. Um, my understanding is that the command made a conscious decision to not have any American face involved in that initial investigation. Even in the Afghans came under fire from uh, um, from some of the leaders. Okay, well we, um, we have, I'm going to, hopefully we can stay a few extra minutes, um, so I just want to open it up to questions, please. Yeah.
Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is for the, the colonel. Um, the, the stip of fact and the transcript of the sentencing, where would I locate that? you got to put in a FOIA request. So you, you got to go. FOIA request? Uh, of you have to course, you the United States Army. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I'll also tell you that I'm not a FOIA expert, but I will tell you that it's pre-decisional. So the way our courts work is that um, once you have, whether it's a guilty plea or a trial on the merits, um, the, a record of trial, um, the transcript is composed. The defense gets an opportunity to review and then submit matters to the convening right, authority. Not, not until the convening authority approves it. Only then. Uh, okay, so you're saying the convening authority has not yet approved it? To my understanding, he has not. This is, we're based here at the convening authorities at Joint Base Lewis McCoy. Okay. Lewis. And then, and then, was it up to the, the convening authority to make the decision as to whether or not to go for the death penalty? And where does that impact U.S. credibility, legitimacy, and transparency? Um, the first answer is yes, absolutely. Um, we have uh, um, each convening authority or general court martial convening authority has the authority to make decisions over his cases. Um, so, as the state of Texas uh, might have a different uh, um, uh, process than the state of Washington, for example, convening authorities have their own. Um, Staff and advocates who make their own decision. Second part, I'm not qualified to comment on that. I'm, I'm a prosecutor. Just going to ask because the Afghanistan and the United States will be signing, uh, hopefully, the bilateral security agreement. Uh, one of the major problems between the two was the issue of immunity versus jurisdiction. For the longest time, the Afghan media were talking it's immunity, which equals impunity, but now finally, some people correct said it's actually about jurisdiction. Uh, first question. This is more not necessarily Bale's case, but if one of the things that, that, that they're referencing Bale's case, that Bale's was drinking, and so there are uh, uh, all these Afghan media is discussing is like, oh, what happens if US soldiers get drunk and go outside? Um, you know, uh, that, you know that, that there's no punishment because Americans already trained, so you know, the, the soldiers, in a way, basically, if they have jurisdiction, they could be drinking. And they have all these theories. What are the, for me personally, like the journal order, the, the commission, is it any different from, for instance, for tro troops are stationed in Korea than troops stationed in uh, Afghanistan? So, so again, this is only my own personal knowledge. This yeah. has absolutely no comment on the future. I will tell you how general orders work. Um, I've been stationed in Korea twice. So yeah, soldiers are authorized to consume alcohol in Korea as they are in Germany, um, as they are in, in a uh, litany of other foreign countries. If you are deployed in a combat zone, then um, general order number one just tends to almost exclusively, to my knowledge, precludes you from a lot of things. Drinking is one of them. So um, how you could probably comment far yeah, better than I, I, I will actually comment in. I mean, there are there are going to be gaps in that because okay. I mean, even in Iraq, general order one was fully in effect, but neither the civilians nor the military that reported directly to Ambassador Bremer through the State Department were subject to the CENTCOM authority. And so general order one didn't cover the military members assigned to the Coalition Provisional Authority, for example. So a drinking out in public by them would not be a violation of anything. So a drunken disorderly would still be a you know UCM jable offense, we'd say. It would be something they could be prosecuted for as a military member, whereas a civilian wouldn't be. Um, but so there are gaps in that. So what I would say on the jurisdictional issue is that I mean, it's a big deal for the United States. I mean, we, we go through tremendous pains and lengths to make sure we can maximize jurisdiction over our personnel. That does not mean, however, that every military person in history has been able to be afforded a court-martial. Some of them have committed off-base rapes and other types of acts where the United States has ultimately ceded the primary right of jurisdiction to the host nation, Okinawa and some other places where we've done that. So. It's not um, likely that we would candidly see jurisdiction in a place like Afghanistan, though, because of the level of the criminal justice system. So while there were different factors in Japan and Okinawa, I'd be surprised if that happened in Afghanistan. And, and what's the, does it preclude, like, one of the other, it's, it's just I'm bringing the Afghan perspective yeah. on that, yeah. and this is that, so they're referencing the Bales case a lot, look what happened. And one of the other issues, like, you know, Considering cultural sensitivities, what if the soldiers violate, let's say, interacting with with the, with women or, or something? They're they're coming up with all. Is there any provisions in the general order that say you're not allowed to, you know? I mean, no. I mean, they can have rules that are specific orders of a base to follow a set of guidelines, such as 
you will not go out into a public place from 5 p.m. and later so that you minimize the contact with the local population. But we wouldn't put out an order that was necessarily culturally based. I mean, we would do, we would set a neutral order that tried to contain behavior to respect that, but you wouldn't see it in, in the way that the Afghans might appreciate. Um, I wonder if, if there's any choice of holding the trial in, in Afghanistan, because we're promoting democracy and so on, and creating um, judicial systems. <coughs> and one would think that, um, I, I don't know how closely we work with the Afghans in terms of the detectives. You said there were detectives that were on the scene the next day. Um, I presume that that investigation went nowhere because the U.S. had custody of the defendant. Um, but clearly there was some attempt, I mean, to, to do something. Sure, and again, I'll tell you only from, from our own per, my own personal experience and our perspective is that um, he was brought back relatively quickly. Um, he actually went from uh, um, Panjway to Kandahar Airfield to a very brief stay in uh, uh, Kuwait and then to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. So he was already removed. So the notion, I think, of again, this is personal opinion. The notion of sending everything back to Afghanistan, I, I don't, I just don't think it was, um, it was or realistic. Or convening the court martial sure. in Afghanistan. Sure. Um, jurisdiction was an issue. Um, in this case, uh, not a very big one. Though. The, start, the unit Sergeant Bales belonged to, though it was uh, at the time um, attached to, I believe, uh, the 82nd. Sergeant Bales was actually operating on a special forces base. His unit actually belonged to Fort Lewis, to Joint Base Lewis McCoy. So the, the easy answer for us was to send him back to his unit, which was Joint Base Lewis McCoy. I will tell you that we did uh, the preliminary inquiry. We called it an Article 32, frequently compared to a grand jury. It's, it's not the same, but it's about the, the closest we, uh, we come, or the closest comparison. We did it half in Afghanistan and half in, in Fort Lewis. So we had uh, US-based um, uh, witnesses uh, testified over the first three or four days, and then we switched and started going late at night, Fort Lewis time, and then we had Afghan-based witnesses testify over video teleconference uh, from Afghanistan. They actually went to a, a base off of Canada. And I have trouble understanding what it was you were trying to prove, because it sounds... In my case. In the Bales case, because... At the Article 32? In the court martial. I was, we were trying to prove 16 counts of premeditated murder. Because it seems to me that he admitted it by saying, my count is 20, or sure. did you those rat are, me out? Yeah, those are, there's, of course, he's got a defense attorney, so they get a vote as to what type of evidence actually comes into trial. So uh, did he, what did he plead? Not guilty? No, he pled guilty to all 16 so specifications. So what do you have to prove then? At that point, nothing, once he pleads guilty. But I, as a prosecutor, you can't anticipate that someone's going to plead guilty. You have to prepare yes. for trial for a contested court machine. Um, I will tell you, we do something a little bit different in the military. We have a, a providency inquiry or a care inquiry. Um, care is based on the name of the, uh, the case. Um, when a soldier pleads guilty to any offense, he has to enter into a colloquy with the, the, the judge. So he can't just say, I'm guilty, sit back down, and the defense attorney handle. He actually enters into, um, uh, we in our case require a stipulation of fact. That can be something that the prosecutors require of the defense. That's a document that says all parties agree that everything contained is fact. Um, the judge can use that to determine whether or not Sergeant Bales is actually guilty. That's a requirement in military courts. You have to um, be guilty according to the rule of law. You have to believe you are guilty according to the rule of law and either have no defenses or waive those defenses. And you have to convince the judge that you are in fact guilty according to the rule of law and believe that you are guilty according to the rule of law. So, so at that point, you're right. We had nothing else to prove. Um, so you didn't... You, you, you brought the witnesses from Afghanistan for the pre-trial hearings, is that um, right? No, they testified from Afghanistan for the pre-trial. We, we brought them for the sentencing hearing. I have, we have time for one more question, so I'm just... I'll yeah. talk to you afterwards, because yeah, part of it's yeah. our system. Okay. Um, was there any sort of amends process besides the trial to provide assistance or support to the victims and their family members? Yeah, so a, a couple of them. One is we... Um, uh, would pay Salatia, and, and you probably speak better than that. I will tell you that, that Salatia was paid in this case. Um, I don't specifically know if it was DOD or um, it was the convening authority. So yes, they were, they were given money as a form of, of uh, um, Salatia. Um, we also, this was more, um, this is as is typical for any witness in any American court martial. When they travel here, we paid them per diem. 
Um, so normal uh, um, temporary duty allowances, pay for their lodging, uh, and give them money for food. The exact same amount as if you had been called as a witness at one of those trials. Yeah, well, I want to please join me in thanking our panelists. Um,